I'm constantly designing something, somehow, and I know that. So as I would think about or read the text, I could see it. And that meant the job of the set designer had to be close to what was in my brain. And I was successful in that. My guideposts in any, any production I'm doing are the words of the author and the, the sort of ideas of the director. So in this case, I had August Wilson's play and his wonderful words and the story he's created and these characters. And then the things that were important to LaTanya were the, the, this physical presence of a ghost that we see and that we can touch in a way. And this house that represents the family that has a fissure in it, a, a wound in it that closes up and is healed in the course of the play. Um, and what I love doing as a set designer is, is transforming space, is finding a way to create a set that is kind of a sculpture that is evocative of, of time and place and emotion and have that change in the course of the play. And, and hopefully that change then illuminates the themes of the play that the director and the, and the playwright are trying to express. I have always loved Beowulf's work. So when I talk to him about what the idea I had, especially about breaking the set and all of that, he was undone that I had so much information. So he said, you know, directors usually say, how do you see it? I said, oh, well, forgive me for that, because I'm going to tell you how I see it. So then you can tell me what you think. But first, let me tell you what I think. And we went on from there. Latanya is sort of... It, it, her energy and her just like saying, what about this, what about this, what about this, was was great. And as we started talking about the piano itself, um, I think, you know, we had been talking about Kara Walker. So at one point I said to her, well, what if we, what if we talk to Kara Walker and see if she wants to actually design the look of the piano for us? And I think Latanya thought about it. And I, I jokingly, what she said is it might be a little too pornographic for what we want. Um, and, but I, but I took her point and that's when she first suggested to me this Makande sculpture that she owns. Um, and what if we had a piano that somehow was based on a Makande sculpture? And um, because that kind of sculpture is, is kind of an, an open carving of these intertwined figures, but you can see through it, that is what very quickly led me to, to the thought that, oh, well, then the piano should be something that comes alive. There should be light. There should be smoke inside it. There should be this kind of life force that begins to emanate out of it as it comes to life. Um, and that afternoon, I sent her a picture of a bunch of just like little candles with kind of a, a cutwork frame on them that cast interesting shadows on the room around them. And I sent that to her and I said, this is what the piano should do. And she, I think she just wrote back, yes. I, I remember when I asked you about the scarf for Mama Bernice yes, for, the, yeah. for the head <laughs> yeah, and yeah. for Charles, who's actually the little boy, he was nine years old when yeah. you know he was taken away and everything. And, and so you came back, I said, their faces need to be prominent. And yep. there they were, prominent with the scarf on the head. It was yep. that kind of detail that just excited me to no end. And the fact that all the story that Sam Tell, that Doker tells about the funeral for Mama Esther and all that that is actually carved in. That's why I was saying the detail of the 3D printing, I think, is much better than what we could have hoped anything for. We, anything we would have yeah. done if we tried to do it with, with styrofoam or, or even wood or something. But now, and over here, we've, we've got, uh, got them jumping the broom. We've got... Uh, e Mama Esther's funeral. Mama Esther's funeral. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Papa Boy Charles as a baby. Yep. Um, and we have them being uh, led away. Yep, taken off of Mr. Nolander's farm. So. There's our piano, but thank God it's going to the Smithsonian. Yeah, so, so this will have to make new for London. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's true. It's okay. We know how well, to do it. Yep. We, know how, we yep. know how to do it. It's, it's a play that's about family and how we struggle and yet end up, as long as we're connected, we always have a way of getting through. Um, Bernice and her brother, boy Willie, are at odds about what should be done with the piano because Bernice wants to hold on to the legacy of the history of the piano by keeping it in its place, tidy and polished. Boy Willie wants to make it a part of the American dream by selling it and getting a stake in the American dream by taking the money 
and using it to buy farmland so that they can make the money, you know, turn, turn the piano over into something that is going to perpetuate a lifestyle change for the family. It ends up being a story of who this family actually is and how, against the odds of where they come from, they succeed in life, or they continue to succeed in life. Great experience. Uh, I'm not an actor, but uh, during uh, uh, one of the uh, rehearsals of the play, we lost an actor, and I walked through the role of the actor for like three days, and I got to find out a lot about the character just portraying him. So it was a very valuable and very good experience for me. And I thought it would be nice if I had the opportunity to walk through all the roles in the cast <laughs> for three days. And I would really feel like I had a handle on it. The first thing I wanted to do with the play, with the piano lesson play itself, was to understand what his intention was in the play, what I thought his intention was, um, what I saw as a woman, because we see things differently than men, and that means in understanding as well. So I wanted to know what I thought and could take away from what he, his actual intention was before I started futzing with what my vision was. You know, so I only tried to support what I thought he was doing. So that was what I knew was my challenge, to make sure that my vision and my creativity and me wanting to be um, an auteur of his work didn't get in the way of what his work was actually saying. With any set that I'm doing, I, I do tend to think of the set as kind of a character. How does it, not that it's a living thing, but it is in a, its way to me, and how does it interact with the actors and, and as part of the story? Um, and so one of the givens in this, from the beginning, was LaTanya wanted this, this fissure in the house, this kind of brokenness of this family, and, and a way to show the, the mending of that. Then I, I had the idea, well, what if we see the end of a house? So you're seeing the gable of a house, and it's, it's kind of broken into three pieces. Um, and you see this kind of splintered shards of wood, and the house is, is just made of beams. It's, there's, no, there's no shingles, there's no nothing. There's some windows and doors, but it's basically an outline of a house created in old wooden beams. Um, and that, that sprang a little bit from this sort of Kara Walker staircase we'd been looking at as, as kind of a central pillar of the house. But it also allowed me, by, by abstracting it a bit and sort of stripping it back to its skeleton, it was the skeleton of a house, so it's kind of the, the literally the bones of the place these people live. But in my mind, it was also kind of the railroad ties of the boxcar um, where, where Papa Boy Charles burned to death. And that led us into this exorcism moment where the, suddenly you start seeing smoke and fire licking through the floor planks of the house. So the house actually kind of becomes the boxcar in an abstract way. And then in an even, even bigger sense, it's kind of the slave ship that, that would have brought their ancestors to America. It is this kind of upside down hull of a slave ship, this kind of blackened skeleton of wood that is a cage around them. Um, and it's, it's something that I always strive to do and to varying degrees it, it works or it doesn't work in shows, but if the set is able to be abstract so that it is kind of a house, but it's kind of a box car and it's kind of a slave ship, um, it, it leaves more room for the audience. I think Hal Prince always used to say to me that he leave a lot of black space on stage, a lot of empty space, a lot of room for the audience's imagination. And that makes the audience become complicit with the story you're telling because they start filling in the blanks. And I mean, this of course is the Hill District, uh, but that's just a curtain and that goes away very quickly. But it returns during act two. D during the <laughs> intermission, yes, yep. But I also feel like we talked a lot about like, you know, how big is this house and it's a kitchen and a living room that are kind of combined into one space. Um, and we've got this big farmhouse table that a family can gather around that they brought up with them from the south. Um, but also that, that allows for staging around it. I think that, I, I think even as we started, you had in your mind a lot of you know, how you wanted to play out certain scenes around the table and how many people you wanted to be able to sit around it. 
And the transitory nature of the furniture. Yeah. That nothing matched and that it was like pieces that came about, you know, at different stages of their lives. Yeah, that some of it they brought with them, some of it they found, but that it was all sort of nice. That it's it, Oh they, no, it was nice. They've made they've made like a nice home, but it's not they they didn't go to JC Penny and buy it all. And the two of us kind of coming together to create the world of this was exciting. Um because I, you know, I think I brought the the know-how of how do we do this stripped-down thing that can contort and, and create the the world that she's after. Um, but she's the one who grew up in something closer to this world, and she, you know, often she would say, "Well, my grandmother wouldn't have had something like that. What about this?" There was a funny week where I felt like we were literally trying to find her grandmother's china um, to the point that like this plate with pink roses on it was not correct and this pink with this plate with pink roses wasn't correct but we finally found this plate with pink roses and that was correct um and i you know and she had described what she was after this sort of you know 1920s 30s china but but she didn't have a picture of it we were just kind of shooting in the dark trying to find you know some <laughs> antique china that would work but we did find it in the end but what that gave us was this authenticity to it in a way that you know it was not part of my lived experience so i wouldn't have been able to do it my soul was on fire when i saw that set and once I saw the people in it, I, I've always liked dollhouses and putting people in the dollhouses. I said, I want to see the little colored people inside this house of color. So that's going to be an issue for me in terms of what they have on. I don't want them bland. I don't want the grays and the darkness of the mood. I just want it alive in who this community of people really, really are. We never see this side, this side of vibrancy through the horror that they have to live through. There's something that's not quite finished about that ending for me. So it's like, well, how, how in the dialogue itself do we treat what we think has occurred or what what is it that we want the takeaway to be of uh, what happened between them? And it was the house, it was a closed house. The house heals, they heal. They've come, at least they've got detente, at least, you know, they come to a point where they can be at peace with each other. But I feel like that was from from the very beginning. That was that was sort of your approach to the show, and so I was, you know, I had to figure out how are we going to do that? How do we make that work? Uh, you know, in a way that we can stage all the rest of the show, and you know, it it feels like a very simple gesture. I think the thing feels so solid that I'm not sure the audience sees it coming. I think they just think this thing is here, and then when all of a sudden it starts moving at the end, it's quite a and shock. And they get it. That's why I think they applaud so much because they 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 get it that this entire time they've been trying to like, you know, magnets that were, you know, the same trying to get together. How do they finally come to a point where they are healed enough to be together? Because it's a constant fight the entire time, the entire play, back and forth, back and forth with them. I'm just still enjoying being a part of the actual legacy of saying, you know, I've directed a, an August Wilson play on Broadway. I grapple with that. I haven't had time to think about what it all means. I'm just enjoying each moment as it comes because it's so much, it's so full, and it's a lot. At its best, what we do kind of opens up a, a new world to somebody. You go in and see a play and you're seeing the world through the eyes of those characters or the eyes of that production. And it's a world that you maybe didn't know before. And it's it's allowing you to to live in a, in a time and a place and a world and a character that is not you. Um, and so the whole process was kind of that for me, that I, you know, this partnership with, with LaTanya and, and trying to bring August Wilson's play to life gave, allowed me to kind of walk in someone else's shoes for, for a few months and, and, and see a different world. And, you know, that's, that's exciting and it's fun, frankly.
brilliant. Absolutely brilliant.